remember what we're supposed to do today. Hey. time everybody from the depths of your soul
Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Tell somebody, this is how we fight our battles. <laughs> Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter if my mixer tries to fall off the stand. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by. Help me out, say. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on, tell them again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I love it, I love it, I love it. Say it again, it may. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my 
<laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Tell somebody you can't fight your battles if you didn't have someone who can make a way. Tell somebody you couldn't fight your battles. Come on, tell them, tell them. Say, you can't fight your battles if you didn't have someone making a way. Say, he is my way maker. Sing that with me. You are here. One more time, way maker, way maker, 
But that is who you are. That is who you are. Oh, I thank you that you're working. You're working. That is who you are. Yeah. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is. And Father, we thank you, we thank you that these aren't just words to a song, not just empty script, but that's your name, Waymaker. That's who you are in our midst, and we give you room to move in that capacity today. There are those of us that need you to move, Father. To come out the page, manifest in our midst. Oh, Move past feelings and emotions today. Don't be limited by our, our desire to feel you. Because I think that even, Breathe even when, when I, I don't see you, you your word. Even, even when I don't hear you, your word. You, you never, never stop, you never, never stop working. I need you to tell him this this morning. Even, even, even when, when I don't see you, your word. And even, even when I don't hear you, your word. Yes. You never stop, you never stop working. Do that one more time. Even, even, even when, when I don't see you, your word. And even when I don't hear you, your word. You never stop, you never stop working. That's it. Even, hey. when, even, even when, when I don't see you, you're working. And even, even when, when I don't feel you, you're working. Oh, yeah. You never 
never stop, you never stop working. I need you to look at somebody and tell them, get ready, because he's about to move. He's, he's about to move on that thing. Thank you, Lord. And we welcome those who are watching us via stream. Come on, let's welcome them this morning. Let's welcome those who are with us across the nations, our sons and our sister churches across the nations. God bless you. Welcome into the Good News Worship this morning, this morning. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember early on in, in, in ministry, I, when I would lay hands on somebody, I would limit God to what I felt. And there were times when I would really get overheated and, and very, I could feel power flowing through my body and you'd see people get healed, you'd see the manifestations. And then there were other times where I didn't feel a thing. And they still got healed. God still moved. What I'm trying to say is that he's not limited to what you're feeling today. He's not limited to, to, the, to the flesh and its senses. I need somebody, I need somebody to stand in agreement with me on this today that it's not about what you see, it's not about what you feel. Just know that those that are with us are greater than those that are with him and that your God is moving. He's moving. He never stops. He never stops. Even when I don't see you, your work. Even when I don't hear you, your work. You never stop. You never stop working. That's a word for somebody. Even when I don't see you, your work. Even when I don't Work. You never stop, you never stop working. Ah, oh, yes, Lord. Don't limit him to what you're currently seeing and what you're feeling. We walk by, yes, and not by sight. We also walk by faith and not what we feel. So don't, don't you limit him. Don't you limit him to what you feel. How many of you know he's God in spite of what you feel? He's God. It doesn't matter what you're feeling. The word is the word is the word. And when it manifests, it is awesome in our midst. You may be seated. You may be seated. And thank you. Thank you, Lord. We do honor you in our midst this morning, Father. We bless you on this 36th day in the Feast of Weeks. And we, we count with expectation, excitement on how you're moving, how you're working, and what you're about to do. And we want to lift up those this morning, Father, who have lost loved ones in the tragic things that we see happening around us. We could get caught up in what we're seeing right now. We could get depressed and even fearful over the things that we're seeing right now. But I ask that you be enlarged and magnified in our sight. Even in the eye of the Spirit, let God be magnified. Be enlarged, Father. And we take solace in knowing that even in the midst of these things, you're still working, you're still moving. 
these things are just bearing witness of something greater that you have in store. Mm. So we gather this morning. We rally around our hope. If he's your hope this morning, I just need you to shout. I just need you to just, just scream in the house if, if he's your hope. If he's your hope this morning, can you, can you release a hallelujah? Can you release a yes and an, and an amen and a yes? My hope and my salvation, my promise and my portion. We gather, thanking you that you put us here in this time for your purposes, for your plans. Mm. Yes, Jesus. Jesus. some help doing this. So in the middle of the war, we say thank you. In the middle of shootings in grocery stores, in the face of racism, thank you. In the face of the enemy, I need somebody to help me. And I need somebody to help me rise above what the enemy is doing with a thank you and with a bless the Lord. Yes. Oh, Jesus. Thank you for remembering your covenant ones, Father. For the hedge and the protection you have about your covenant ones, your beloved. Not going by what we're seeing, we 
We know all of this has been pre-told, Father, foretold. And that you have us here in the midst of this to declare your greatness in spite of what we're seeing, in spite of what's taking place. In everything, in everything we give thanks. Yeah. In everything we give yes. thanks. Yes, sir. Oh, let God arise. Oh, my God. And his enemies will be scattered. Come on, church. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Oh, that the church would arise and bless their God. Yes, sir. And the enemy be bound, set aflight in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Father, for what you're doing in the midst of these things now. Jesus' name. Esimo. Mm -hmm. Esimo. 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 Oh, my King. Come on, church, you can do better. You can do better. You can. I wonder if these things are happening because the church is quiet. I said, I wonder if these things are happening because the church is quiet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. You may be seated. We have been in a series called The Birth of a Nation. And as we prepare to pick back up <clears throat> on this teaching, I, I do want to amplify again that we're in a portion of time uh, known as the Feast of Weeks on the Hebraic calendar, on the Jewish calendar also known as the counting of the Omer. And this period of time, as many of you know, was the period that is between the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, for those who are watching that haven't heard some of these terms before, you may know Passover as what we call Easter, the, the uh, celebration of Easter. Uh, that was the holiday, New Testament-wise, in which Jesus... Uh, was taken captive, went to the whipping post, hung on the cross, died for our sins, rose again three days later, and then went on to ascend 40 days after his death. Now it's interesting, in this period of the Feast of Weeks, hear me, the resurrected Jesus is up walking around. During this holiday, now we've shared with you that the reason we do take time to acknowledge <clears throat> the, the Hebraic observances is because what we call Christianity has its roots out of Judaism. Amen? Amen? And we've taught the importance to know the root of a thing. It's, an, it's important to know the root of a thing. How did this start? Where does this come from? What we call Christianity has its origins in Judaism. And so there were instructions and, 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 and principles that God put in place back then that Scripture tells us were shadows, types and shadows of what was to come in the New Testament. I think we quoted this last week. The New Testament reveals what the Old Testament conceals. And so what we uh, know as Passover uh, would come into a, another level into the New Testament, much of what we call Easter today. Jesus said this, I didn't come to do away with the law or the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill to fulfill what was written. So 
much of what we see uh, take place in the new was foreshadowed, and there were types of this in the old covenant. So this is why we take time. Now, Passover, you can seek to pass over that, but your king died on Passover. Okay, he became the Passover lamb. He, he became the, the, the actual and final sacrifice for the sins of man. Aren't you glad this isn't something we have to do every year? Okay, where we have to kill a lamb every year. Jesus said, I'm going to complete this thing with the final sacrifice of his own life. But all of that foretold and foreshadowed what would take place in the new. And so then they were told to celebrate this period. It's a 50-day period between Passover and Pentecost, or seven weeks, the Feast of Weeks. They're to celebrate this period, and that on that 50th day, we find from its origins that this was the day when the Hebrews uh, left Egypt on Passover. 50 days later, they're at Sinai, and on the 50th day, they receive the law. God gives the law to Moses and the people. And so they're celebrating this period of time, and even now as we're approaching the, the day the law was given, something else in the New Testament happens on that same day. And see, this is why we just can't ignore these things. This is why we just can't cast this to the side. Because as the Hebrews, they leave Egypt, they make their march towards Sinai, and it would be a 50-day process to get to Sinai, and then there'd be a waiting period, and then on the 50th day, God would give them their constitution. We've been sharing with you that during that period of time, he was forming a nation. This was about the birth of a nation. He was bringing forth a people for himself, something he told Abraham all about was about to take place as they were leaving bondage. He told, he told Abraham, he said, your people are going to move into rebellion and disobedience, and they're going to go into a time of captivity, but then I'm going to release them to go into the promises that I promised you. And so as they're leaving Egypt, God is forming a nation. He's forming a nation for himself. Now watch this. During this same period of time. It's the exact period of time we're in right now. Folks, the Hebrews are marching to Sinai right now. It's the exact period that we're in right now. Now, push forward to the New Testament. Jesus died on Passover, rose again, and the Word says he actually made two trips to heaven. He actually made two. The second one we know about, but many of us miss the first. And we can find it just in a, in a little piece of scripture. I don't have time to go there right now. But Mary Magdalene is there at the tomb, and she loves him so much. Even though he's died, she's there to dress the body. She arrives. She finds the tomb has been opened. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. The tomb has been opened. This didn't happen with any other sacrifice before. This is the first time the sacrifice got back up. She arrives, the tomb is open. She looks inside and she becomes depressed because it seems as if, as if someone has stolen his body. And she hears someone next to her. She believes it's the caretaker of the cemetery. And she says, sir, just tell me where you've laid him. Just, just tell me where you've, where you've placed him. I'll, I'll take him off your hands. And what she didn't know was that she was talking to he who went in as a sacrifice and has now arisen as the high priest of the New Testament. She's speaking to the master. And it wasn't until he said her name. 
You see, you can't always get caught up in what you're seeing. I think we just said it a minute ago. You can't, oh, come on, let me find somebody preaching. You can't always get caught up in what you're seeing. That, that empty tomb and not seeing his body uh, brought, brought even greater fear and depression, but she didn't know that God was up to something. Can you look at somebody and tell them that God is up to something? God is, he's up to something. And he speaks her name, and she looks up, and she recognizes that it's him. And she says, Rabboni, and she reaches out to touch him. And he says, don't touch me. I'm in priest mode. I'm in priest mode. You see, the, the, the high priest during that period would have to take the blood of the sacrifice into the holy of holies. And so Jesus said, I... I have yet to ascend to my father and your father. I've got to go up and take my own blood into the sanctuary not built with hands and make a deposit at the mercy seat. (laughs) You see, because there's a new level of mercy coming, and it's going to be stimulated by my blood. So he makes a trip up with his own blood, to apply it in the sanctuary, on the mercy seat, not made with hands, the throne of God, the throne of God, and then makes a trip back. And you might say, well, where is all of that? Because then we see him, listen, in the period of the counting of the Omar, he comes back and he's interacting with the apostles. He's freaking them out, walking through walls, walking through doors, going and recovering them because they had scattered. He's recovering them during this very period we're in right now. This is literally the period that we're in right now. And he says to them, he allows them to touch him. He wouldn't allow her because he had not made that that trip and carried out that priestly duty. He allows them to touch him at that point especially Thomas, because Thomas is caught up on what he's seeing right now. And he allows them to touch him, so this trip had been made. So during this period of the counting of the Omer, 40 days of the 50 days, Jesus is here recovering the apostles, recovering the disciples who have scattered. Word says he was seen by over 400 people. During this period, the resurrected Jesus is up. Now, this is, as we shadow back, as we shadow back, the Hebrews are making their way to Sinai, to Sinai, to meet with God at the mountain. These two things were literally happening uh, simultaneously or or in a parallel consideration during the same period of time. So it would seem that these holidays desire our at- attention as God continues to unfold and reveal remarkable things, remarkable things that would take place. So Jesus, we are 37 days on the calendar as of tonight. As of tonight, at sundown, we're 37 days into the counting of the Omer. Jesus rose on day 40. This Thursday, this Thursday is the anniversary of the Ascension. During this same period of time, you would miss that if you weren't aware of the details. God's a God of details. If you weren't aware of the details that are taking place. Why should we celebrate this period of time? The resurrected Jesus was back up and moving in the earth in this period of time. And he tells tells those that assemble to him, he says, now I want you to go and wait. Go and wait. Go into Jerusalem and wait because something's coming. Something's coming. You see, at Sinai, and as they made their way from Egypt to Sinai, God is birthing a new nation, a new nation for himself. And at Sinai, we would see him come with all of 
the, the necessary pieces to form a nation. We touched on these last week. Let's throw that up quickly. Let's put that, that slide up quickly for just a moment. These are the components that make up a nation. And we find that these go into play at Sinai. All right, first, to form a nation, you need a government, you need laws, you need a constitution. God brings those into play there at Sinai. Now, we're, we're bringing attention to this because it, it's necessary that in this period of time, we understand that we're a part of another nation. That we understand that we are a part of, a, of another country. The word says we're ambassadors here, so we're from someplace else. Okay. And this is being outlined here at Sinai. And God comes with government. He comes with laws. He comes with the constitution. He says, this is the way I want you to live. These are the standards that I have in mind for you. These are the components now as we begin to form a new government. Now, they were a people made of tribes at that point, but God's about to establish a nation for himself. He's about to establish a nation for himself. Let me, let me read this, this, this piece for you as we come back to this. Thank you, Lord. Ah, oh, my goodness, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 reads, And you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. You've seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Exodus 19, verse 4. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Somebody shout covenant. Then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, he's forming a nation for himself. And this nation, he says, I want a nation of priests operating in the earth. I want the entire nation to move in a priestly capacity. Now, it's interesting. As we read deeper in the scripture, we find that he didn't get what he wanted. He didn't get what he wanted. How many of you know that God does not always get what he wants? Because of free will. Because of free will, he doesn't always get what he wants. He will ultimately get what he wants. But there are times because we have free will. Con consider, if you will, those times that God wanted you to do something and you didn't do it. Amen, somebody. Okay. It's his will that all would be saved. Will he get what he wants? Mm. He wanted... Not just one tribe, he wanted a nation of priests. He ended up being limited to what we call the Levites, but he wanted the whole nation to move in a priestly capacity. Now, don't limit the priesthood to this. Okay, it's, it's, it's much bigger than this. It, it, it always was. You see, he wanted them to live their lives like they were ministers, servants, servants. The word minister simply means one who serves. This government, this nation would be full of ministers. There's still some nations today that, that, that form themselves in a similar capacity. And so you have in certain nations the minister of education, the, the minister of the interior. Here in the U.S., we call them secretaries 
But see, in the kingdom that we're from, there's no secular. It's all ministry. I'm going to preach over here a minute. <clears throat> it's all ministry. We serve as we serve unto the Lord. So your calling may be an educator. Your calling may be an engineer. Your calling, you may be a businessman. In the nation that we're from, God says, you're all ministers. And see, this is what he wanted. He wanted a nation of priests. He didn't get it. Just limit it to the Levites and the, the short capacity that came with that. How many of you know he could have gotten a whole lot more done? Could have gotten a whole lot more done if they would have gotten this. So he's forming this nation for himself. And I can, I can just visualize this as he's pulling together his covenant ones, seeking to bring forth now this new nation, and they're all priests. They're priests. Now, once again, Pastor, you are reading the Old Testament. What's the application for us? How does this compare to us? Let me keep reading. He says, and you shall be a nation of priests unto me. You shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. He's talking to Moses. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered and said, All that the Lord has spoken unto us we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. They did not hold to their word. They did not hold to their word. He then is relegated or limited to the Levites. So how does this compare to us? Well, when we read in the New Covenant, he says that we're all kings and priests. Kings and priests. He says, I didn't get it the first time, but I'm going to get it this time. I'm going to get it this time. As we awake and understand that we're all reverends, that we all serve in a capacity as ministers. We're here to minister to people. We don't, we don't have jobs. They have jobs. We have callings. We, have, we, are, we are placed to minister on the behalf of the Lord. We have occupations, places that we're called to occupy on the behalf of the kingdom that we're from. We call them occupations. God says, occupy until I come. Occupy this position. Let's go back to the components of the nation there because the last one, the last one, to have a nation, you also have to have, to have a military. Every nation needs a military. In the nation that we're a part of, we have angels, warring and battling angels. But guess what? God also has you. He has me. The church is also a part of the military. And we have positions that we occupy. Now, in Jerusalem, if you, if you are born and raised in Jerusalem, everybody has to go into the military. There's no choice. Everybody spends time in the military. Everyone. And they're taken through that place of service. And I want you to know this. You're in the military right now, whether you want to be or not. You, you need to understand you're in a battle. You're in a warfare. There is no demilitarized area here. We have to, we sang it this morning, we have to learn how to fight battles and fight them spiritually. And one way the church fights is that we do it with our praise. We do it with our worship. We create the environment. Hear this. I, I read where Satan was kicked out of heaven. He's kicked out of heaven. Now, God says, I'm going to establish my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not advance against it. So when the church is in place, hell begins to back up. It begins to back up. Hell should hate it when we gather. Hell should absolutely hate it when the church gathers. But if you don't know what your praise is for, if you don't know what your praise does, then you'll sit there and you'll just, you'll just do this kind of thing and not understand that God inhabits the praises. And that we can create an environment. Watch this. If Satan was kicked out of heaven, I read that we can create the environment of heaven so we can kick him out of this place. We can kick him out of this environment. But for those who don't understand that you're in, a, you're, you're in warfare. And that praise is, is, is about warfare. And you might come in low and depressed, oh, but you don't have to leave that way. You don't, you don't have to leave out of here that way. When we get around one another and we understand what this is all about, I wish I had times to read, time to read Psalms 149. When we, when we read, watch this, God says, when you, pray, when you praise, when you worship, you begin to whip, I'm going to paraphrase, you begin to whip upside the enemy's head. You begin to whip upside his head. But too many of us sit there and let him whip us upside the head. There's an old song that we sang many years ago when I was out in the world called Oops Upside the Head. Oops Upside the Head. I want to hear Satan singing that one because the assembly has come together and we understand. I see you, Rod. And we understand who we are. Oops Upside the Head. You need to understand that when you shout, walls come down. You need to understand that when you shout, God shows up in the midst. You need to understand that when you shout, when you shout, demons begin to flee. When you rise up and you begin to release your voice of authority, the enemy begins to back up. Somebody say, I'm a part of the kingdom. The nation. The nation. So this birthing is taking place. As they're making their way to Sinai, and they're at Sinai, and God gives them a constitution. He starts forming. He starts forming the elements to make a nation. The offerings start here. Offerings start. Interesting. Now, they're practiced in some capacity. Abraham was a tither before the law. Before the law. Moses wasn't around yet. Abraham was a tither. Isaac, Jacob, they all tithed. Actually, if you go back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel got into a fight over giving. One got jealous over giving. But here, here at Sinai, God starts calling the gold and the silver in. The offerings start. The financial system of the kingdom gets developed. Now what I love <clears throat> about this is that the people got it. They got it. You see, this is why, my God, God didn't tell them, now, you've been here in Egypt 430 years. Get your stuff and run. Run. Let's go. Let's go. Now, he did tell them that night, put your shoes on, put on your belts, girt yourself up and eat in haste because we are going to move quickly. But before you go, before you go forward, I need you to go back. That'll preach all by itself. Because a lot of us don't want to go back. We don't want to go back and get stuff right. 
We don't want to go back and reconcile stuff. Oh, that's the past. I'm into the, I'm into the future. Well, the past can affect your future. God said, before you run out of here, I want you to go back and confront the people that whipped you, that spit on you, that took you into bondage. Go back and confront them because they have something that belongs to you. They have 430 years of back wages that belong to you. The word says, he said, I want you to go back, knock on the door, tell them I'm here. And I'm about to leave. And the God that brought the curses <laughs> is the one that sent me. And the word says those folks couldn't wait to give them all their money. They just say, here, take it. Take it. Just go. Just go. Leave us alone. Leave it there as a part of my offering. I'm about to start an offering here in just a minute. I'm just, I'm getting the pump prime. <clears throat> I got to watch her at home like that too. I got to put that away. That's, that's dangerous around her. <laughs> they started, the word says, they spoiled Egypt. They spoiled, they stripped it. They stripped it of everything they had. Everything they had, now, wait a minute. How does that compare to us today? Well, I read that in the last days, God's going to take the wealth, of the, the wealth of the wicked and give it into the hands of the just. Somebody say covenant. Somebody. You see, there are parallels happening, folks. He's going to strip this stuff out of the hands of the wicked. And not so that you can just go buy new stuff. Now, he doesn't have a problem with you having a nice car. Wants you to have a nice car. Wants you to have a nice house. But there at Sinai, you see, he had to have them go back to get what he was going to ask for. Ah. At Sinai, they would take some of that treasure and the offerings would start. And they would build the tabernacle. Build they would begin to give towards God's plans and purposes. I need to say that one more time. They would begin to give toward God's plans and purposes. And they got it. They got I'm looking forward to an offering like this one. Moses had to give the word, tell them to stop. Don't bring any more. We can't handle it. It's so much. It's so much. And we read where the furniture in the tabernacle is 24 karat gold. God begins to bring in those resources to further his purpose. Purpose of our giving, same thing. This is to further his purposes, his cause. And so he had them plug into his financial system. Much like in the New Testament, what he's trying to get us to do. He says, let me disconnect you from the systems of the world and plug you into the systems that are in the kingdom. We have our own financial system. I got, that was the weakest amen I've ever heard. Can I, can I have the church say amen? amen. <laughs> All right. All right. There's another financial system where he says, I'll bless you in spite of the economy that's going on around you. Now listen, a lot of inflation going on right now, isn't it? Crazy stuff going on with the economy. You want to plug into the financial system of the kingdom right now. Trust me, you do. Trust me, you do. You want to be a part of a system that's greater than the systems of the nation. You want to plug into the guy who owns the cattle up on a thousand hills. You want to plug into the man that will have you to sow in famine and reap and reap. Okay. We have a financial system that goes beyond anything natural. Somebody shout kingdom. We have our own in the kingdom. 
Educational system, we, we, we cover these. I won't take time to labor on each one. Education, language, language, interesting, interesting. Yes. Counting of the Omar. Yes. Counting up, we're on day 37. Heading toward day 40, resurrection of Jesus. Jesus says, hey guys, you got 10 days left, go wait. Go wait, 10 days left, and we celebrate Shavuot which again was the celebration of the day the law was given. Go into, into Jerusalem and wait. They gather in a place that we read about called the upper room. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. Gather in the upper room and they're waiting and they're seeking God and they're praying. And on the same day, hear this, on the same day the law was given at Sinai, as they're together seeking God, I read that there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it began to shake the place, and something landed up on each of them that looked like cloven tongues of fire, and the word says, and they, be, they all began to speak with, new, with a new language as the Spirit gave them utterance. Tongues is the language of the kingdom. We have our own language. We're a legitimate nation. We are for real legit. We have our own language. And it's amazing how diverse this language is. How incredible it is because our God is big. Amen? Our God is big, so this, this language is big. Sometimes he can have you speak in another earthly language. And then he can have you speak in languages that you don't understand. I love how Paul put it. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. We have our own language. And so during this count, Jesus says, go and wait 10 days. The language part of the kingdom is coming. The language part of the kingdom is coming. And as we're approaching the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot, that again is the day the law was given and the day the Spirit of God came to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and bring forth, bring forth the ability, watch this, I can speak a language I didn't go to school for. Amen. Incredible. Incredible. And the word even lets us know that not even Satan knows what you're saying. God's got a way, God's got a way to have communication with, with himself and us that the enemy doesn't understand. Watch what he also says. He says over in, in Romans chapter 8, he says, the spirit is also able to help your infirmities. The word infirmities means weaknesses. And then he makes this statement. You don't know how to pray as you should. You don't know how to pray as you should. This is New Testament. Wait a minute. I know God. I know God. You don't know how to pray as you should. He says, but the Spirit, the Spirit himself, oh, we got, we got it. But the Spirit himself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God said, even when you come to the end of knowing what to pray, I'll give your spirit what to say and help you to speak those things that need to be said. Now, I need to try to move, move ahead in this, but, but this, this, this language that we call tongues, it had, it's multifaceted. Not only am I able to speak those things that God once said, let me give that to you again, by, by being filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit, God then gives me, gives my spirit what to say. Because there are things that he needs spoken in these last days that we have limited understanding of. He says, I'm going to give you that capacity. I'm going to give you that ability to speak mystery. Speak mysteries is what the scripture speaks to us. This is 
all a part of the language of the kingdom. And then he says, and at the same time, you begin to edify your spirit. Wow. You mean when I pray in the language that you give it, my spirit gets stronger? Yes. Yes. Folks, in the last days, you're going to need your spirit stronger. You're going to need your spirit stronger. So, so don't put this gift on the shelf. Bring this gift out and make it a part of your daily operation, okay, where you are praying in the spirit and fortifying your inner man. Nothing worse the enemy hates than a believer with a fortified spirit, with a strong spirit, one that's able to say no to temptation. Can I tell you a perfect time to pray in tongues when you're tempted to do something wrong? Perfect time perfect time to build that spirit up. It's like, oh, there, there it is. Because the enemy knows what will get you. He, he knows what will get you. That's the very thing he's going to put in front of you. Perfect time, perfect time to start praying in the Holy Ghost and tell yourself that's beneath me. That is, that is beneath who I am. I'm a king, and I'm a priest, and I'm going to start birosatakari ebunachiela isante And on that, on that 50th day, they all were filled. That's the day we're approaching now. That's the day we're approaching. Hear me, as we've been talking about the birth of a nation, that would be the day the church was birthed. Pentecost. Church was birthed. So this period leading up, crucial, full of facts and information, incredibly power-packed as they were becoming a nation. We too, the, the, the type and shadow forward speaks of something new being birthed. I believe we call it in scripture, the new birth. The new birth, something new being birthed, and a new nation being formed that God says, you'll be kings and you'll be priests unto me. Kings and priests unto me. Now, why should we look at this yearly? Why should this draw our attention yearly? Because God had a habit of, of putting these reminders in front of them. Number one, so that they wouldn't forget, so that this wouldn't just go by the wayside. But they would also be prophetic indicators going forward. They would point to some things that he, was, that he would unlock and reveal in time future. And so I see as, as we approach the day of Pentecost in just a couple of weeks, that that was the day, that was the day the outpouring of the Spirit started. Let me share one more scripture, and then we will, we will wrap up. That would be the day of the outpouring of the Spirit. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. Start reading there. It says, this is he that came by water and blood. We shared with you, as we've been in this series, you can't have a birth without water and blood. You can't have a birth without water and blood. That first Passover night, God had them take the blood of the lamb, put it over the doorpost, oh, on the lentils. He was about to birth something. It would protect them from the death and destruction coming into the city. But then as they were beginning to go forward, we needed water. Because a birthing has to have water associated with it. It's interesting. We find them at the shore of the Red Sea. And this became concerning because it, the enemy closed in behind them, and it looked like they had nowhere to go. But how many of you know, like we sang this morning, <laughs> he's a way maker. He's a, he's a way maker. 
And see, this is why you can't go by what you see. What looked like an obstacle was about to be a birthing chamber that God would take them through. Here, look at somebody and say, here comes the water. <laughs> here comes the water. Takes them through the Red Sea, baptizing them unto Moses, taking them forward to the place where he's establishing a new nation. So Jesus, Jesus, this is he. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. But by water and blood. Well, we, we touched briefly on this last week. Where was the water? We know that he shed blood on the cross. We know that blood came out of the hands. We know the blood from the crown. We know there was blood from the feet. Where did the water come from? How did that come into play? And how, does, and, and how was the scripture then complete? Well, we, we, we found that God moved up on a, on a guard next to him to take his sword. I don't have the time to go into it, but that was the prophet Nathan's sword. He took the sword. He goes up to Jesus. Now, he didn't do this to the other two. Didn't do it. Goes up to Jesus, thrusts the sword in his side, and the word specifically tells us that blood came out, but not just blood, also water. Water poured out of him as well, because we are made up largely of water. So water poured out of him as well. And this scripture was being satisfied along with, watch this, the curse that Nathan, the judgment that Nathan spoke up on King David. David had sinned, had an affair with Bathsheba, did not come to God and confess that sin, let that sin fester for years, for a year, could have gone to God and repented, owned it, taken responsibility. And when you don't confront a sin, it develops roots and it becomes a generational curse. You got to confront that thing. You got to put blood on it. You got to kill it. You got to kill that thing. You have to expose it and uncover it and say, Lord, I'm guilty. I did it. Take responsibility. He didn't. He didn't. So Nathan told him, because, because you didn't take responsibility, the sword will never leave your family. Sword was an instrument of judgment. He said, this sword is going to be a problem to your children, your children's 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 children, because of what you've done. God said, I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers down to the third and fourth generations and perpetually. Now, this was a problem because Jesus is a part of this bloodline, this curse. Jesus is a part, and there he is. Now, that's some Old Testament stuff I just shared with you. But you see how it gets resolved in the New Testament. There he is, hanging on that cross. The guard takes that sword. Now, he's also going to bring forth the water for the new birth. Let me say that over here. He's also going to bring forth the water for the new birth. But we're also going to do away with the curse of that sword. Sword goes in. Blood hits the sword. Curse broken. Curse broken because the blood is a root killer. The blood is what breaks generational curses. The blood is what severs and sets free. Jesus says, this stops with me. It stops with me. Not going any further, this curse stops with me. And isn't it awesome that we have him and his blood to break curses that we might be dealing with as well? 
All we got to do is take that blood back. All we got to do is go back. Don't, don't be in such a hurry to go forward. Go back first. Go back and place that blood. Take ownership for what you've done. Take ownership. You may even need to take ownership for what your fathers have done. Because that stuff's still living. And you can apply that blood and have that thing set free. And watch this as we're making our way toward Pentecost. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited as we're coming toward Pentecost. Because Peter makes the statement, this is that which Joel, the Old Testament prophet, prophesied. And we're going to pick up here next week because there are things that are about to be released in the short days ahead. And you're going to be glad that you're here. You're going to be glad that you're a part of what God is doing in the earth. You're going to, you're going to be glad. You're going, to, you're going to see some horrific things. A thousand are going to fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come nigh you. It shall not come nigh you. And you and I will get to be light in the earth for the king. Part of that military out here to declare and decree that our God is greater. Our God is awesome. Our God is bigger than any demon. Any demon. So be with us. Join us next week as we pick back up on this period of time that we're in the Feast of Weeks, the counting of the Omar, the day of the outpouring. I'll end with this. That wasn't a one-time thing. That wasn't a one-time thing. That was just the beginning. The good stuff God saves for the end. Come on and give him a praise right now. Give him a praise. God bless you. We'll see you next time.